There we go. Thank you, Moe's Food Bowl, for stopping the bottle. Hello. Um, we're going to be talking about Sherry today. And this is going to be a very different and quite weird video for me because I don't normally make videos like this. I've wanted to make this video for probably about a year longer, realistically. The reason why I haven't is every time that I've gone to make it, there's been something else that I've wanted to talk about and I've wanted to add to it and make it more sort of epic and grand and fireworks and cinematic and all that nonsense. And I decided today that I was just going to put the camera on, face it, literally, and talk about it. Um, because I'm coming to the conclusion that I'm never going to get it done if I don't just bite the bullet and just say, John, just do it. Fucking do it. It's gonna be swearing in this. I make videos about alcohol. Um, so these videos should be 18 plus anyway. So to people that have commented in the past saying, are you sure you, you know, wanna swear in these? Yeah, I've got a bottle of sherry that we're gonna be trying at some point. And I'm gonna kinda of go over what sherry is, how it's made, the very different styles of sherry, and maybe recommend a couple of bottles as well. I don't know, this is kind of fast and loose. I've got some notes here to kind of guide me through it, but it's gonna be mostly me spewing out the stuff that I know. I don't know how I'm gonna edit this yet because this is so far out of my normal comfort zone of how I do videos that, let's, let's just go for it. So, what is sherry? Sherry is a wine. If you take absolutely nothing else away from this video, then take that away. Sherry is a wine and should be treated like you would treat a wine. Um, there's variances depending on the kind of sherry that you're dealing with, but we'll get into more sort of the different varieties later. But as a general rule, the lighter styles that look sort of like a Pinot Grigio or a Sauvignon Blanc, you should treat those as if they are Pinot Grigio or Sauvignon Blanc. Um, they keep the same, so you should ideally keep them in the fridge. Um, if you want to drink them, maybe take them out of the fridge 10 minutes beforehand, let them get to room temperature a little bit. You don't want them warm, but you want them not quite fridge cold as well. This is like a, a sweet spot with them. You only really want to be keeping them for about three days. Most sherries, they do them in two formats. They do them in 70 CLs and they do them in 37 and a half CLs. I don't know what that is in ounces or whatever it is they use in the US. So sorry, you're just gonna have to look that up for yourself. I don't know. Absolutely do not store it on a back shelf or on a window for six months. That's why loads of people don't like sherry because historically people have stored sherry very, very badly. I've been guilty of it myself before I learned what I know and now I'm talking about that. So that light wine that we've already kind of talked about, we'll come back to it again properly later. But we're gonna quickly talk about it as a wine because it is a wine, there's grapes involved and where there's grapes, you need to talk about soil. So the grapes that are used in the production of sherry, there are three types. There's Palomino Fino, there's Pedro Jimenez and there's Moscatel. Palomino Fino is about 90% of the overall sherry production as a category. And then Pedro Jimenez and Moscatel is the remaining 10% in fluctuating amounts. The majority of sherries are grown in a soil called Albariza. Uh, it's a limestone rich but nutrient poor soil. It's very chalky, but it retains moisture very well. In the summertime, it can be stiflingly hot no rainfall whatsoever. So when they do get rainfall, they'll want soil that retains the water that it gets. Most Palomino Fino branches, if you ever see a vineyard, they're very knotted, gnarled, they look like they're having a horrible time, but they produce some fantastic grapes. And that's the grape variety that goes into the majority of sherry. You've also got Barros, which is a dark clay kind of a soil. It's not ideal for growing Palomino Fino, and it's normally only used when they're having high demand, basically. So it's sort of like emergency soil, essentially. Um, but if you can, you'd use Albarizo. The last variety is Arenas. I'm definitely butchering pronunciations on this. I'm probably not even going to try, but it's a sandy soil, and it's found in coastal areas by the sea. It's not great, again, for Palomino Fino or Pedro Jimenez. It's normally used for Moscatel. Also, the cat's being a whiny boy at the minute, so you might periodically hear meowing. I've tried letting him out. I've tried letting him back in. I've tried feeding him. I've tried holding him. It's nothing, he just wants to whine today. So we've covered the soil. Now we're gonna talk more about how the production of the sherry works. Sherry is produced in a very unusual way for wine. It's produced in something called a solera. If you imagine, take a barrel or a wooden cask. Fuck it. <clears throat> okay, I buckled and let the cat out. What were we talking about? 
Solera, that was it. So, a Solera system, it's basically how the wines are aged. So, imagine a barrel or a cask and then flip it on its side and then make a pyramid out of other casks, essentially. That's a Solera system. You start at the top, you work your way down. Sort of like a game of Plinko, I suppose. And basically what happens is, for each year's wine, it moves down the Solera system and then they add newer wine to the older wine to make this super aged complex wine, essentially. So now we know the grapes that are involved, we know the kind of soil, we know sort of roughly how it's made. We're now on to the kinds of wine that we have. So most people's complaints about sherry is that it's sweet. The example that I'm gonna be using today is an example of a sweet sherry, but we're gonna start off by talking about sort of the other end of the spectrum, which is the driest wine on the planet. Fino and Manzanilla, are some of the driest wine that you can encounter. They're biologically aged, which means they are matured under a layer of floor yeast. Basically what this yeast does is it eats all the sugars in the wine. A lot of it starts out anaerobic, so no oxygen, not really any sugars because the yeast's eating it all, and you end up with this sort of crazy complex, super light wine. It's almost like, it's almost like sharks picking meat off of a skeleton, so you've just got the bones left of it. That's maybe not the most appealing way I could have put it, but essentially it's what you've got. It's this super light, crisp, acidic, kind of brioche sourdoughy kind of a wine. I like introducing people who have either never tried sherry or think they don't like sherry to this particular variety, and just watching like the the hamster in their head running to try and catch up with what it is that they're experiencing right now and like their whole world you kind of coming crashing down around their ears it's quite funny personally for me i'm not a huge fan of these but that's a personal opinion i've seen so many other people that absolutely adore it because of the flavor profile it's got i'm not a massive white wine drinker to begin with so that one was always going to be fighting a losing battle with me it's a fantastic one to have in your arsenal if you just want to fuck with people a little bit, it's great. The next step in the journey that we have from dry to sweet, we have Amontillado. This one's kind of got a double life going on. It starts like a Fino or a Manzanilla in that it starts under floor. And then over time, either through natural processes or by having the wine fortified up to 17%, the yeast is either killed or dies off. What then happens is the wine, for the first time in its life, is exposed to oxygen. So think about it when you cut into an apple, how it's all crisp and white, and then within a few minutes it starts to turn brown. The same process for this wine. It becomes oxidative. So it develops more kind of complicated walnut fig kind of flavors. Um, but it's also got a lot of the leanness from its previous life as a pheno, so it's a really interesting kind of mishmash of two different styles that no one can really quite put their finger on. For a long time, people didn't understand how Amontillado came to be. In some cases it would be an accident, in other cases it just wouldn't be very well divulged or they wanted a bit of mystery around it. Nowadays we know how it's made. Um, it starts out under yeast and then ends its life without yeast. Further to that, you've also got Palacatado. Um, Palacatado is essentially an accident or a mistake, uh, for want of a better way of putting it. It will start its life off as a Fino or a Manzanilla, and then it will get assessed uh, by the people in the bodega. And <sighs> he's out the window now, screaming his head off. If it's assessed not to have the qualities that they're looking for in a Fino or a Manzanilla, it will then get transferred over to the Solera for Palacatado and then it will start aging oxidatively. It's, again, it's got a characteristic that no one can really put their finger on. It's got a weird kind of leanness, but a salinity, and then there's kind of like walnutty, chocolatey things going on. It's a bizarre one, but it kind of has cult following because, again, no one can really put their finger on what makes a palacatado a palacatado. It's quite a subjective thing. So you can get quite a variety in palacatados because you don't make a palacatado. It just kind of happens. Then getting on kind of like the meaty end of the dry sherries, you've got Oloroso. So in terms of athletics, you've got a ballet dancer and you've got a sumo wrestler. Um, the ballet dancer is your Fino and your Manzanilla, and then you've got your Oloroso, which is your sumo wrestler. It'll, it can still move, but it moves in very different ways. Much more kind of rich, dark, toasted flavors with this one. Unlike the other ones, this one doesn't spend any time under yeast. So it's oxidative, 
throughout its entire life. It's the only life it knows. It tends to be a little bit stronger in alcohol as a consequence of that because it doesn't need to keep any yeast alive so it can be fortified and in fact it'll need to be fortified quite a bit because again it doesn't have that protective layer of yeast so the evaporation rate in this sherry tends to be a bit higher. So they need to keep fortifying it to keep the alcohol levels at the minimum requirement, which is 15%. Olorosos, they tend to be kind of walnuts, figs, almonds, chestnuts, very nutty, basically. Um, some people have also said that certain varieties, you can get things like chocolate, wafer cones, maybe even like a bit of a sugared presence. Loads of people assume that an Oloroso is a sweet wine. It shouldn't be. There have been some kind of janky things happening in the past where some Oloroso gets blended with some Pedro Jimenez and it's called things like Oloroso Dolce and things like that. They've now been banned um, by the regulatory body for sherry. Um, so you can't do that to an Oloroso anymore. You have to declare it as a blend or a cream sherry. So you don't get sweet Oloroso anymore. Um, Oloroso by its very nature should be dry, but it should have some very appealing earthy flavors to it. That's an Oloroso. And then we get to my personal favorite variety, which is Pedro Jimenez. I've got a massive sweet tooth and this stuff is sweet. It uses a different kind of grape, so all the previous shows we were talking about use Palomino Fino. This one uses Pedro Jimenez, hence the name Pedro Jimenez. Basically they get the Pedro Jimenez grapes which are naturally rich in sugar and then they're left out in the sun for a couple of weeks to raisin. This style of sherry is probably more characteristic of what people assume sherry is. It's luscious, sweet, it's cloying, it's a fantastic, fantastic dessert wine. And we're going to pop this open in a couple of minutes and I'm going to try it. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the bottle as well in kind of like vague and ethereal terms. Uh, and then the last variety we've got is Moscatel, which again is made from Moscatel grapes. I'm not going to lie, I don't know much about Moscatel um, other than it is another sweet variety of sherry. What I will do is I'll do a bit of research about Moscatel and I'll leave some notes down below. Right, we're going to finally dive into this bottle which has been sitting here patiently for some time. This is El Candado uh, and I'm just going to sort of read the back of this because the grapes are gathered after a vintage and allowed to ripen for two weeks in the warm Andalusian sun of Yeras de la Frontina. So what we were saying earlier. Uh, only the finest grapes are used, produced and bottled in Spain since 1822. Valdespino Pedro Jimenez Sherry is man's gracious gift to man to be enjoyed on the rocks or neat at any time of the day, especially at the end of the meal instead of a sweet. El Candado, the Spanish translation for the padlock, is a unique sherry produced only with Pedro Jimenez grapes grown in the sherry district of Spain. It is the classic Yerath wine. These premium grapes are our world famous vineyard, are the only grapes in which this classic sherry can be produced. And you will notice indeed that it has a padlock on it. I had this bottle recommended to me. Um, another bottle that I would recommend is the No PX 30 year old. It's by uh, Gonzalez Bias and it's, it's incredible. It's fantastic. But this is the one we've got today and I'm expecting some slightly different flavor notes compared to other PXs that I've tried. So, so there's a padlock, we need to get into it. Here's a key that I prepared earlier. There's something really satisfying about unlocking, there goes the key. There's something really satisfying about unlocking a bottle of booze. So, I don't know how well you can see this because I don't know really how I've set this up. So I'm gonna kind of hold it next to my face. Does that, that work? Yeah. PX should look like oil, basically. It's super thick and viscous. I've heard of people that have gone on like bodega tours in the past thinking that they're about to get poisoned. There's some kind of a joke going on here because it, do it doesn't look like any kind of a wine that you'd want to drink. It kind of looks like the black stuff out of Prometheus. For those in the know, it's, it's, it's fucking nectar, this stuff. Oh yeah, man. Raisins, pan au chocolat. Yeah, there's, there's something like quite brioche about it. How I've described this stuff in the past is raisin juice. Um, if you don't like raisins, then you're not gonna like Pedro Jimenez. There's no getting around it, you're just not. Oh wow. Oh, I'm so glad I bought you. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. It's not as over the top sweet as some Pedro Jimenez that I've had. Don't get me wrong, it's still sweet. It's still absolutely a sweet wine. There's like a milk chocolate thing going on with it, which I don't think I've ever had with a PX before. Um, the raisin notes, while they're still there, they're less pronounced than they have been in other PXs that I've had in the past. Okay, like an aftertaste of like wafer cone. You know, like if you go on a sunny day, or you could have done before the apocalypse happened, um, and you get an ice cream in a wafer cone, 
like a chocolate dipped wafer cone. And there's like a sugared almonds kind of a thing going on as well. I'm not sure if I'm describing this very well, to be honest. Um, it's sexy AF and I am Oh, I'm gonna drink the fuck out of this stuff. That was my little talk on sherry. Um, I don't know how informative it was, I don't know how rambling it was. Um, if you want more information, I'll leave a few links to a few bottles that I would recommend people try. Some of them are gonna be Amazon affiliate links because money, um, I'll get like 10p. So, you know, it's not like... Also, oh, hello. <sighs> There's a book here. Uh, it's called Sherry by Talia Biocchi. Biocchi? Biocchi? I'm not quite sure how to pronounce her name, sorry. Um, and it's amazing. Um, I've had this book for a good couple of years, um, and it just, it goes through absolutely everything. It's a tour, it's a love letter, it has recommendations for bottles, it demystifies a lot of stuff, and it's just really easy to read. Um, so. That's an amazing book. That'll be linked down below as well. Uh, I'm also gonna put this as part of a Sherry playlist. I've done some Sherry videos in the past and they'll be in there as well, but I'm also going to put in some other videos just on the internet in general of people talking about Sherry and Sherry's influence on whiskies and things like that. Hopefully it'll be sort of a resource to get people talking about the wine because it's just good stuff, man. You should be drinking it. You should be drinking loads of it. If you're a whiskey drinker, you should be drinking Sherry because so many people lose their minds about, actually, I think, it, you got just, oh, I'm never doing this again. There's a sherried whiskey. Look at the colour on that. It's beautiful. People lose their minds about sherried whiskies, and then when you say, oh, what's your favourite sherry? They're just like, sherry's a drink? What? But you know, it strikes me as one of those things which should be a lot more expensive than it is, and that's purely because there's not a lot of demand, because loads of people don't know what it is. This bottle was, I want to say like 12 quid, and it's formidable stuff. Like, absolutely incredible. Yeah, it's a half bottle, but it's still cracking value for what it is. Because it's bloody good. When we get on the other side of obviously events going on at the minute, if you're having a dinner party, crack that out. See what people think of it. Maybe don't mention that it's sherry. And then kind of go, haha, you're drinking sherry, what do you think? And then people will love it, and then you'll be great. Or something. I don't know. If you've got... <laughs> if you made it this far to the video, thank you very much, because this has been rambly. I've been a rambly boy today. Um, thumbs up if you like my high-vis cardigan. Yeah, I didn't even think. I just stuck this on because it's kind of cold still. If you're not subscribed and you've come across this and you're kind of intrigued, I don't normally make videos like this. They're, I wouldn't say better, different. Yeah, subscribe to the channel because I do talk about booze a lot. Um, leave me a question down below, actually, um, just about sherry in general. Maybe grill me about Moscatel because I did not come into this well, well prepared for that. That was bad. That was bad of me. I'm sorry.